use their professions to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm going to introduce to you right now, a person who did that in a very uh, unique and interesting way. Uh, Dr. Martin Cook um, is an academic. Uh, he's been an academic his entire life. And when I say academic, I mean academic in the absolutely, positively best sense of the word. Graduated from the University of Chicago with a degree in philosophy. He's taught at a number of places, uh, you know, uh, almost a full career at Santa Clara University before he went into the system of professional military education. He taught at the Army War College where we met. He's taught at the Air Force Academy, at the Naval Academy as the James Bond Stockdale Chair of uh, Leadership and Ethics. He is an ethicist uh, and a philosopher by trade. So imagine, if you would, hearing about a place on the other side of the world and saying to yourself, geez, that's really interesting. How can I help? Writing a letter to the provost of a, a university in West Africa saying, hey, here's who I am. If you need me, let me know. And then picking up your family, his lovely wife, Nicole, who's in the audience, and flying to West Africa for nothing. <laughs> nothing. No salary, no nothing. Just uh, room and board and the opportunity to teach at a place that captured his heart. So Martin's going to come up here and tell you why this place captured his heart and about his experiences at Asashi University, Ashesi University in uh, Ghana, West Africa. Well, this is going to start as an adventure story, but it's going to end with a Rotarian pitch. <laughs> so um, about three years ago, I was getting ready to retire from the U.S. Navy, where I've been teaching for the last some years, and uh, we, my wife and I were watching the PBS News Hour that night, and we saw a clip, and I want to play the clip for you, and then I'll tell you what an impact it had on us. So, as soon as you can roll that. It looks like a pretty typical college campus, with students working in computer labs, studying at the library, or hanging out with friends. But Ashesi University in the West African nation of Ghana has embarked on an experiment which its founder hopes will help start to fundamentally change the entire continent. In the next three decades or so, the population of Africa is going to double. And something like 40% of working age people are going to be Africans in the world. A lot of jobs need to be created. And so we need to be educating the next bench in a way that they're going to go create those jobs and create those opportunities for people. Patrick Awa was born and raised in Ghana, but came to the United States on scholarship to get an undergraduate degree in engineering from Swarthmore and an MBA from the University of California, Berkeley. He went on to become a program manager at Microsoft. Conferences here. When he decided to return to his homeland, he assumed he'd start a software company but quickly realized the system of higher education was so poor there wasn't a competent workforce to hire. Experts say the problem with education in Africa is not so much that there aren't enough institutions, but rather it's in what students are taught and how they're taught it, with emphasis much more on rote learning and memorization, much less on critical thinking, on thinking for oneself. Under colonial rule, and the educational system was really designed for that to educate people to follow instructions and to do things in a very consistent way. So Awa decided he had to start his own university. With money from American friends, colleagues, and foundations, he raised two and a half million dollars to open a school with an initial class of 30 freshmen in 2002. Ashesi has now grown to a campus of nearly 800 students. The guiding principle throughout has been a laser-like focus on three principles, ethical leadership, innovation, and entrepreneurship. We need a lot of innovation. We need people who are trained to drive that. And we need people who are going to be working on the government side. who are going to create an enabling environment for that. Ghana, like most countries in Africa, has been plagued by government-related corruption, which has hampered job growth. In the next three to four minutes, come up with a list of things that a brick can be used for. Ashesi's goal is to teach students to fight against the temptation of corruption and think outside the box. 
It begins almost from the moment a freshman arrives on campus and takes a mandatory course called Foundations of Design and Entrepreneurship. How many do you have? 29. 29. <laughs> the instructor says, you go find a problem that you think is worth solving and then come up with an answer to the problem. It's very open-ended. And the mm -hmm. scary in part, I imagine. It's scary, it feels like you've been thrown into this kind of weird world where you can't plant your feet on the ground, right? It's a very different way of approaching education. When you see a problem, your first human instinct is to think of the first easiest solution that comes to mind. Professor Rose Dodd, an Ashesi alumna herself, says she hopes the class will encourage her students to take on the entrenched establishments in Ghana. Not be limited. Don't feel that whatever the system is limits you. Think about what else could be um, and then try it out. Um, and I think the, perp the, the goal, the end goal should be to make um, life better for everybody around you. Look at the question on the board. Indeed, many Ashesi graduates have gone on to do some form of public service, whether it's teaching in rural elementary or secondary schools, or mentoring the next generation of young women. But you had a big presentation yeah, this week, I had right? A How did it go? It went very well after. Yawa Hansen Kweo became the first female student council president at Ashesi in 2006. While in college, she began thinking about a way to help women grow into leadership positions a goal she made a reality with the founding of Leading Ladies Network. Our goal as an organization is to help women get out of themselves and their problems and to start thinking of what kind of change they can bring in the community around them. One young woman that Quayo has mentored is Narki Agbetter, another Shesi grad. She's just started her own small business selling virgin coconut oil products. And while she's enthusiastic about her company, she admits it's not always easy dealing with government bureaucracy and seeing competitors resort to bribery. There are solutions to every problem out there. It, it requires thinking, so you want to be successful and you want to be ethical as well. We will have a generation of leaders. Patrick Awan knows that his young idealistic graduates, many who come from families of modest means, will be severely tested out in the real world, but he hopes the lessons they've learned at Ashesi will help guide them. Are some alumni probably not holding up the, you know, the line? Probably. Um, but I hope that even those who are not holding the line are thinking twice about, about doing it. The other cultural problem that Awa hopes to change is stopping the so-called brain drain where, after college, people leave the continent to seek careers in developed countries. So far, 90% of Ashesi graduates have stayed and work in Africa. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Fred de San Lazaro in Accra, Ghana. Okay, so we saw that. And so I got online, looked it up, found out they had a foundation in Seattle, and uh, wrote them a note and said, uh, RCDs, and said, uh, I'm just about to retire. You don't have to pay us anything. Do you have any use for us? We'd like to come over and be useful. And so within about a week, I got a call saying from the pro saying, can we have a, a Skype conversation with you? And we did that. And uh, at the end of that, she made us an offer. Said, we, we have a house uh, on campus, and we will give you airfare. And come on over. So we did. Um, and it was a truly wonderful experience. I'd never been anywhere in Africa. So let me tell you a little about the university. First of all, this is the mission to educate a new generation of ethical and entrepreneurial leaders. Uh, the emphasis on ethics is intense, so as, a, as an ethicist myself, obviously that's one of the hooks that got me interested. Uh, what does that mean in the African context? What does that mean in the context of considerable government corruption? Although, by African standards, Ghana has a pretty good government, has a pretty good president right now, uh, had an election just before we got there. Um, and uh, they got their, uh, and a concern with critical thinking. I mean, what he says about the education system that we saw at, for example, the University of Cape Coast, is that it's all a relic of the British colonial system. They're literally reading British textbooks from the early 20th century at some of these old universities, and, and they have classes of a thousand students. Um, 
and they're very, very corrupt. So when Patrick got back and looked around, he really saw, I just can't hire the kind of people I need for the kind of company I want to have. So that's 20 years ago. Uh, here's an example. When General Electric decided to go into Ghana, they didn't even bother to interview people. Said it was 12 of your best graduates from Mashesi, and that will be GE Ghana. That, that's, that's all we need to know, is that they're graduates of Mashesi. So uh, here's <laughs> the kids, they said 800, that fellow was about three years old, so it's now about 1,000 students. Um, this is the campus. I mean, you walk around this place and you think, this is one guy's vision after 20 years. One guy's vision after 20 years, Patrick Gaywell. Uh, he recently won something called the Wise Prize for Innovation and Education, which is given out by the United Arab Emirates. It was a half a million dollars. Uh, he didn't keep dime. It all went back into a founding university and building scholarships and so forth. So this is the student bodies. Now uh, it's perfectly gender balanced. That's no small thing in Africa. Uh, that uh, it's women. Um, they say I think it's out to 26 African countries. Um, so I had kids from Swaziland, Nigeria, Kenya, uh, Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, um, just all over the place. Both francophone and anglophone students. Um, and they have six degree programs. I mean, one of the reasons, they don't really need me because I'm a humanities guy. What they really need are science, engineering, and business people. Because the problems of Ghana are those kind of practical problems. So um, while I think they enjoyed, I taught classes that had never been taught there before. I taught comparative religion. And I taught uh, ethics and international <coughs> affairs. Um, and that, those were both a lot of fun. And the kids were really interested in learning both about African religion and about uh, Asian religions, about which they knew nothing and are very poorly represented in West Africa. It's overwhelmingly a Christian country, uh, although the North is, is Muslim. Um, so we had both Muslim kids and Christian kids. And the good news right now is the relationship between those communities on campus is very warm, very friendly. There are no felt tensions. Uh, I don't know whether that'll hold. Um, they're building an enormous mosque in Accra right now, funded by Turkish money, um, and teaching a much more conservative kind of Islam. So it might harden the lines over time. I don't know. That's something to watch. Um, here's um, the statistics. 62% are in STEM degrees. We were, dri we were driving into Accra. For, it's about an hour from, to Accra, the capital. And we picked up a young Ashesi woman that was going to go to the bus stop. And we were chatting with her in the car and said, well, what do you really like about Ashesi? And she said, oh, I really like that it's a liberal arts school. And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, yeah, I wouldn't have taken computer coding as a freshman. Uh, that, that's what she meant by liberal arts. It was something that was pushing her out of what she wanted and never would have thought of doing. 100% um, of them are going to get a job almost immediately. Um, the uh, most amazing statistic, I think, is this last one. 90% of them really do stay in Africa. They may go somewhere else. For example, one of my wonderful teaching assistants, Mao Li, uh, Ed Myers, and went and did a master's degree in Hong Kong. And he's still working in Hong Kong, but he'll definitely be back in Africa at some point. He's just getting a kind of global experience to take back. I've also said, Mal, if you can learn a little Mandarin while you're in uh, Hong Kong, the world is your oyster. <laughs> Africa, uh, the Chinese are all over Africa, everywhere we went. Um, this is the campus from above. Uh, it's up on a hilltop above a very, very primitive village called Barakuso. Uh, the last five miles of road into the campus are the worst road you've ever seen in your life. I'm not exaggerating. I mean, driving around enormous boulders and so forth. Um, when, uh, so it's, a, it's an adventure just getting down to the main road. Um, more of the campus. Something wrong there. Can you can we go in again? And obviously, you know, when you have this many African countries represented on the campus, that's not just interesting while they're students, it's going to build a network of these kids all over Africa. If they're going to stay in touch with each other, these will be movers and shakers. And uh, if you're, if you know how a few people in Africa get serious higher education, these guys are the future elites of West Africa. No, no question about that. Um, that's the last yeah. that's There's that. only seven slides. On that. Oh, I must have sent you a preview. Um, okay. Well, I, I thought I had four slides on that, but anyway. Um, 
That's fine. Uh, one thing that <coughs> may be interesting to you is I'm on the international committee of this chapter now, and we met last week, and uh, there's some, some interest in figuring out what, if anything, we could do for this university um, through Rotary or through this. I also found out, I talked to the uh, foundation, uh, one of the board of trustees members of the university is also head of the biggest Rotary Club in Accra. Uh, and I've already been corresponding with him, and there's an interest in possibly coordinating between our Rotary Club and theirs. Um, how can you help? There are a number of things. I had a slide that was, how can you help? I'm sorry, I lost it. First of all, if any of you are retired engineers um, or businessmen and you would like to go there, that's one of their biggest challenges, how to hire competent faculty to teach what they want to teach. Because if there were competent engineers and technical people in Ghana, they wouldn't need the university, right? That's what it's for. So um, if you are a business person or especially a computer science or a technology engineering person, um, they would certainly love to talk to you. Um, and I can promise you, you have a very wonderful experience if you went there for six months or a year. Um, another thing you could consider, if this really interests you, the foundation runs an annual trip to Ghana, which is coming up in October. Um, and so if anybody's interested in going to Ghana and seeing it, as well as seeing a good deal of Ghana, they do some tourist stuff on that trip as well, um, that would be a possibility. Um, and so I think with that, <coughs> let me uh, take your questions. Um, please. Yes, um, I was interested to note that um, everyone speaks everyone speaks English. Is that the language of Ghana, or is it the language of the university? Um, it was a British colony, so English is the only common language. There are probably I don't know twelve or twenty tribal languages in Ghana. Uh, the main one is Tree T W I. Um, you may not know that if the Europeans hadn't shown up, the Ashanti Empire, which was based in Kumasi, north of Accra, was the big power in West Africa. And if Europeans hadn't messed with it, um, they were pretty, pretty militaristic too. They would have definitely dominated West Africa as a, a well-organized imperial state. There still is an Ashanti king, there's still an Ashanti palace, um, uh, and it's, it's really cool to go through it and see what they had. But uh, if you see pictures of Kumasi before the British came up, you'd be shocked. It was a well-organized city with nice houses and streets, and, and it was uh, nothing like your image of Africa. It was a colonialism that put them back to where they are now. But of course, you also have all the Francophone villages from Cameroon and to Cote d'Ivoire and places like that. Uh, but the language of instruction is English. Um, and they couldn't talk to each other in their tribal languages. And, and they, all, all they could speak probably three or four languages. Uh, but, uh, could you um, could you say how um, tuition is handled, and um, are they all on scholarship, uh, yeah, or yeah. Um, and and the cost for the yeah. students? That's another slide I dropped down. Uh, half of the students are on scholarship. Um, most of that comes from the Mastercard Foundation. Um, so, for example, my other teaching assistant, Mercy, uh, was the daughter of a single mom. She'd grown up literally in the back of a market stall along the road in Kumasi. Um, she was so smart that she got herself into the best private girls' school, the Methodist school, on scholarship. And then she got to a chassis on a full scholarship. So half the students are full scholarship. Um, the, one of the things that the foundation identified that we might help them with is what they're calling bridge scholarships. That is kids who have some money, but not enough to pay for the whole thing. Um, and uh, that, that's a gap that MasterCard doesn't fill for them very well, so that's something we could talk about. And then, of course, there is, there is wealth there, I think. My, my other teaching assistant, in Mali's dad had worked at the Bank of Ghana, and nobody's rich by American standards, but by Ghana standards, he was well off. And what's the cost? The cost, I don't remember off the top of my head, I'm sorry. Oh, I, I just... <laughs> it's 7704 Thank you. <laughs> Did you hear that 7000 <laughs> Uh, and that includes board, room to work, too, I think. I'm four dollars short. Have you ever heard of an organization called Catch a Fire? What's it called again? Catch a Fire. No. It, they recruit volunteers for Africa. Oh. And uh, I am a retired engineer, PhD from MIT, and I volunteered several times, and I think people in the club will understand this. I get rejected. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> and I don't know why. It could be because I'm Jewish. Yes. Well, I don't know. Uh, 
But uh, yes, I'm. I'm no. I'm interested. I have uh, friends in Ghana. One, one of them is a prominent lawyer, Yao Otu Nyampong. Are you familiar with that no. name? You know what Yao means? I don't. Thursday. <laughs> well, yeah, Ghan Ghanaian names are interesting. You know, they're, yeah. uh, uh, I'm Mercy and Mali were my two DAs, but yeah. uh, a lot of religious names. Too. But uh, yeah, I'd like to talk to you. Sure. You probably knew Colonel Waken at the academy. Oh, of course, I were friend. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So, what's the criteria for getting into this university? Yeah, well, the, and kind of talk about how the kids get involved. Yeah, well, they're. They're pretty active recruiting. Obviously, they're uh, looking for considerable intellectual talent. I mean, it's, you don't need too many intellectual nuts at this place. I mean, they were coming out of the, be the best pri private schools. They have, there's an application process. It's pretty much like an American admission system. They're looking at, at the quality of the student. Uh, I mean, it's pretty rigorous, so someone who wasn't, didn't have the stuff wasn't going to make it through it. Do they have, like, SAT? No, nothing like SATs or those kind of standardized tests, at least that I'm aware Yep. Yes, hi, Randy. Yeah, this is a related question about admissions as well. The selectivity, is it highly selective? I mean, you sort of just answered that, but do they get twice as many applications as they have slots, or do you have any statistics? Yeah, I never, never saw any statistics on that, but yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty selective. Um, and, and as I mentioned, it's really perceived very much as an elite school, not just in Ghana, but mm -hmm. you know, in all of the sub-Saharan Africa. So being from Ashesi means something. So I have a um, quick question, um, obviously. I'm ecstatic that they have gen uh, achieved gender equity. How big of a feat was that, and how did, they, how did, how did it happen? I, I think Patrick just decreed when the university started, that's what we're going to do. Wow. Uh, we're just, just, I mean, that's a, a big African problem, and we're going to try to fix it. Uh, I mean, I, I lost the little slide, um, but one of their t-shirts uh, says on the back, building ethical leaders to transform Africa or something to that effect. I mean, that, that's their modest goal, we're going to fix Africa. Um, and uh, yeah, um, so, it's pretty, I, mean, you know, I think we came back, you Nicole, know, you agree? I think we came back more impressed than we were when we, when we left. I mean, it, it, it really is living up to what it says it's doing, so it was quite impressive. Uh, what is the limiting factor to the number of students at the session? The faculty of student ratio, is that your question? No, the number of students at a session, what is the limiting factor? I, I'm having trouble hearing, so I'm sorry. What, what limits the number of students? Oh, what limits the number? Um, faculty. Uh, I mean, they're, they're incredibly busy. You know, uh, we thought, and the provost, who was in America, she's now moved on, but she thought when we went that I would be running colloquia in the afternoons for the faculty and meeting with people to talk about research and publication. And almost none of that happened. And we realized very soon because they're, they're, they're running like crazy. I mean, for one thing, most of the they don't want any, they don't want faculty living on campus. They want them to be out in real gutter. So there's that. And so if you're coming from Accra, the capital, you've got to be, uh, they run a bus, a shuttle bus, right, morning and afternoon, which means they're on fixed schedules, right? So they don't have a lot of uh, flex in their time. Uh, most people are not going to drive their own cars. It's too expensive. Even if they've got them, you wouldn't want to drive them every day. So the, the, most of the faculty and staff show up on the bus at 8 o'clock in the morning. And most of the faculty and staff get back on the bus at 5 and 4.30 in the afternoon and go back to a crop and they stop at various places. So they're just stretched really, really thin. Um, yes? Go ahead, uh, Thanks very much for your uh, talk about Africa. You are a professor of religion and philosophy. Yes, sir. You uh, are a professor of religion and philosophy. Uh, what is your biggest concern about teaching moral values to Africans? They come from with moral values from their communities, but that's a challenge to you. So, what do you? What is the thing that's on your heart about well, teaching values? That's a very complex question, as you might imagine. Yes. Um, um, first of all, your first impression, especially in southern and central Ghana, is that it's extremely Protestant religious. Um, and, uh, and the kind of Protestantism it is, is prosperity gospel, if you're familiar with that, which you know, teaches basically if you give the, give the preacher a lot of money, God will reward you. So if you look at the big houses around, they're either uh, government people or they're clergy. Right? That's 
where the money is in, in God. So that is very disturbing in a way because, frankly, it's very hard to, not to think of Marxist thoughts about religion when you watch, watch the way this works in God, right? Uh, this, is a, this is the opiate of the people taking money from poor people to give to clergy. Um, so that's a concern. Um, another thing that was, I never really got my hands around because um, if you talk to them about African indigenous religion and culture, which I did a lot, um, in fact, when we were in Kumasi going through the, the, the Ashanti Museum, I kept asking this not very well informed tour guide questions, and, and, were not, and I was not getting very good answers. So he said, Well, why don't you go talk to that guy at the bookstore? So I went and talked to the guy at the bookstore. Turned out the guy at the bookstore was the curator of the museum who'd read, read African studies at Oxford. And so, so when I got back to campus, I called him up and said, Hey, uh, Justice, could I get you to come down here and give a talk about African traditional religion? Um, and he did it out of the goodness of his heart. We bought him a bus ticket and we put him up for the night. That's it. And, and, and he loved it. He had so much fun doing it. But the kids have integrated this very well, the African side to the evangelical side. So we, they'll often refer to African traditional religion as juju, uh, which is a derogatory term. But it's everywhere around. You walk around the villages, you see these little shrines around the village and so forth. So th that's one thing. You know, where are they getting this stuff, right? Uh, the Muslim kids, of course, are getting it straight out of Islam. Um, and so, but when I taught the ethics and international relations class, that was kind of easier because it wasn't about personal ethics. It was about the development of the international system and the creation of the United Nations and how the international system worked and so forth. That was just sort of learning about uh, stuff. Um, not a great answer, but it's probably the best I can do. Sorry. Yes, sir. Oh. With, with all the graft and corruption that you were mentioning, all the graft and corruption that you were mentioning, does that put the uh, graduates of Ashesi at a great disadvantage? And how do they compete with that when there's so much of the other? It must be very frustrating. I wish I knew the answer to that. Uh, the last evening we were there, we went to dinner with Patrick and his wife. Uh, and one of the questions I asked him was, why don't you have a public policy program or something that's aimed at government service? And he said, because we're sure if we had students going directly into that, they'd be corrupted. Uh, so we, we want to work with, uh, we think you have a better hope of success about building ethical ethics and, and ethical um, uh, business people. Uh, but for example, while we were there, there was a South African team installing solar panels on all the roofs there. And I got to know the South African guy who was managing this pretty well. Uh, he said, you know, one thing I've noticed is um, some of my workers, I really have to watch like hawks. But if I take the Ashesi engineers, I can leave them alone because I know they, they know what, what good looks like and I don't have to watch them. Uh, they'll, they'll be doing it right uh, by first world standards. We're, we're good with it. Hi. You mentioned uh, there's a very primitive village right next to the university. Yes. And the university looks like all it needs to, is a big swimming pool to be a marvelous resort. <laughs> What's the relationship between the surrounding community and the university? That's a very interesting question. They, they do a lot. They do a lot down there. For example, there was a big trash dump in the middle of the village. Um, and the university organized a cleanup of the trash dump about four years ago. And that, and that stayed cleaned up. And, that, and they retrained people how to deal with their refuse so they're not trashing the, the village anymore. Uh, the Shesi kids go down there to teach in the school, um, and in the summer the kids from the village come up, they have several programs for the kids that come up um, and do academic work up there. Um, uh, and that's impressive because we went to another village school up in the north by Kumasi. And they were teaching computers, for example, by having a chalk drawing of what a computer keyboard looked like if you were ever to have one. Wow. I, mean, you know, I mean, there's just not, nothing in that place except uh, you know, a bunch of kids and dedicated teachers with chalkboards, but that's all they have. You want to hear? Martin, this yeah. is a question. I mean, this is something you and I have talked about, but I think it'd be interesting for everybody else. A, a Shesi is a different kind of university plopped down in the middle of a system of uh, traditional uh, colonial type education yeah, system. Sorry. So would, would you talk a little bit about the tension and how a, a SESHI had to kind of fight for itself around accreditation and test taking, all that kind of thing. Well, that's an enormous question. <laughs> uh, SESHI only got its formal accreditation from the government uh, right after we left. So the graduation ceremony after we left, the president of Ghana came to the graduation ceremony and gave them their formal accreditation as a university. Before that, they were on a kind of provisional status under the University of Cape Coast 
which is over by the slave forts on the, on the west coast of Ghana. Um, and that was really a pain because, for example, every syllabus and every exam I wrote had to go to Cape Coast for some bozo in Cape Coast to tell me that my exam was good enough. Right? <laughs> um, um, and so that was really an irritating thing. Um, and it took, well, this was nearly the 20th year of the existence of the university when they finally got the chart. So that tells you a lot, right? Um, even though they were highly regarded in Ghana, they still had to get it through this enormous government bureaucracy and all the old established universities really didn't want them to get it. They were not, not supportive. They were, they were going, we were going to disrupt all this. You know? uh, How long were you there? We were there a semester. Uh, so we arrived in August and came home right before Christmas. Luckily, they gave us the sweatshirts on the way out because we landed in New York in December. It's the only warm thing I had. So we were freezing our butts off in New York trying to get to the bus to the hotel. Got another one here, sir. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, it's my fault. Yeah, you've got lots of time, so I've got lots of questions. Uh, I have friends all over Africa, one of them in Nigeria, named CJ and Wosa, highly educated rocket scientists, if you could believe that and they won't let him out of the country. Uh, have you experienced that, that the educated people, they think, are flight risks? Well, yeah, that's in fact, uh, that is the norm for Africa, right? That talented people leave. I mean, that's, uh, that's what Patrick did, right? I mean, he got a scholarship and he said, he said in one speech I heard, he said, when I got to Dartmouth, I thought, I'm never going back to Ghana. The phones don't work, you know, it's, uh, the, the, the electricity only runs part of the day. I'm just never gonna go there again. And then he said, you know, it's a very moving speech, this wise prize speech he gave at the UAE. If you're interested in him, go watch it, but it's an amazing line. He says, when his first child was born, he said, I don't have the, the power to forget about the continent. I've got to go raise my kids as Africans and do what I can for the continent because uh, nothing good is going on there. And um, he, he went back very naively. I mean, he had no idea how to start a university. He's not an academic. Uh, you know, his you know, part, highest education was a master's degree from Berkeley. I mean, so, you know, he, he was, if anybody was not qualified to start a university, it would be Patrick <laughs> Um And yet he's pulled it off. But made it. No one here. Um, do you know what those six degrees are? Uh, they're, they're all STEM except for business. Is there a cybersecurity one or a computer science? There's one? a civil engineering, there's a computer science, uh, electrical engineering, civil civil engineering, uh, and then a couple of business degrees. Okay, so I'm a certified ethical hacker, keyword ethical. Okay, so there's a lot of corruption in my career field as well. Um, so if I were to go over here and teach, what would that look like for me? I got three okay. kids, my wife's here, I bring them with me. Do, do you get paid to go over here and teach, or? Well, we didn't get paid, but we didn't right. ask to. We didn't ask to get paid. Right. Um, I mean, I don't know what they would say. They wouldn't pay you anything like what you're used to making here. I can assure you that. Um, I think the best salaries are maybe thirty thousand dollars. But know, that's good over there, though. But, but over there, that's a lot of money. Right. Yeah, over there, that's a lot of money. If you took a whole family, you'd have some hard decisions to make about where to live in terms of where the kids would go to school. You'd almost certainly need to live in Accra, which would mean you'd be taking this bus. I was talking about every day. I mean, they have four houses on the campus. You're, you're right about the. I did ask uh, that campus is about the only thing like that in Ghana, except for the luxury hotels. <coughs> and I remember we were walking along, talking to Percy one day, and said, "Is there anything else like this in Ghana?" And she said, "No, not really. I mean, it has reverse osmosis water system, so the water's good. They've got generators for the power when it goes off, which happens all the time." Um, the phones never worked. That was that. Was, that was, uh, <laughs> That's why you got these. But everybody had cell phones anyway. So. Uh, uh, yeah. Hey, sir. I've got uh, two questions with, uh, for you. One was, I was struck by your comment about uh, Chinese everywhere. I'd like you to comment a little on that and what you see. In, you know, you see near term and then longer term. Secondly, uh, maybe the first part is the the issue of. Uh, Opportunities for women beyond the beyond the balancing. What kind of challenges are they facing in uh, in employment and in, in, uh, with uh, family marriages, etc.? Uh, just in general, yeah. uh, the things you observe for the challenges for women, not just to get a good education and be leaders, but then all the other women out there and then how they interface with them. So yeah, I think the, the latter point I can't really address very well, but on the Chinese thing. You've probably all heard of the Chinese so-called Belt and Road Initiative, yep. which involves uh, um, 
giving a lot of money to third world countries for projects which notionally are loans, which the country's probably never going to be able to pay back. And so, they've, they've, and so then the Chinese say, well, if you can't pay us back, then give us that port or give us that road or give, give us that. So they're, they're beginning to uh, realize that, th that this is not good money to take. So we're in Ghana right now, one of the big disputes is the Chinese want to build a mine right next to one of the main nature preserves in Ghana. And they're, they're fighting about this right now. I, I hope they don't do it, but I'm not sure they, they need the money. They did find oil. Ghana has some oil now. Um, so that's good. Uh, for the women, um, all I can really say is what I've seen of the, of the women graduates that I still keep in touch with. Um, so my student Mercy now has a good job at an investment company. Um, one of my other students has gone, gone to Sweden. I uh, to do a semester in Sweden and pick that up. Uh, I mentioned Valley uh, in Hong Kong. Um, but also this emphasis on entrepreneurship is so strong that many of them, I would say, half of them at least, think they're going to start their own business. Um, and how that will work out for them, I don't know, but they're not looking to go just be hired as a dweeb in a corporation somewhere. They're really trying to figure out innovative things they can do. And the whole culture of the place is find a problem that needs fixing. Don't just go plug yourself in somewhere into an existing institution. So um, let me get back to you in a year or two when I see the trajectory of where these guys are going, okay? Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Rodney. You're looking. Yes, sir. I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for speaking. Thank you for all the work you're doing internationally. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Stay warm. World Peace and Understanding Lunch is next week. Y'all have a wonderful, wonderful weekend.